Hi, this is uh, Dr. Churchill again. This is Astronomy 308, and we are returning for our next lecture in the series. And today is going to be about an individual from Portugal named Prince Henry, who's known as the father of continuous discovery. So we are going to pick up with um, where we left off after the Mongolian Empire fell. And uh, if you remember in our uh, what we found in our last series was that uh, the East and the West had been open through the expansion of the Mongolian Empire. And then when the Mongolian Empire fell, that was closed down again. And the reason was is because the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East expanded and then blocked off the East uh, world from the Western world. Um, at that point in time, the uh, Byzantine Empire also fell and that had repercussions for bringing a lot of Greek and Roman uh, and knowledge uh, back into Western Europe and fed the Renaissance and this coming age that we're gonna be talking about. So these events are all interplaying with each other and uh, really drive the future of the world and, and form the planet and the societies and disparities between societies that we have today. Um, so, what I want to do today is then talk to you about how Europe, the Western Europe, responded to these, these global changes, at the well, semi-global changes. So let me start my notes here today for you. I'm going to go ahead and share my notes. And apparently my window has popped over here. I'm going to increase that a little bit. Okay. Uh, so hopefully you can see my cursor moving over my slides now. So today we're going to talk about um, how we went to the seas to do a flanking maneuver around the Ottoman Empire and the middlemen uh, Islamic world that had blocked off the East and the West. And this is a, uh, in the 1400s, and this is a complete transformation of humanity. In a sense, we're um, a well, not quite, we're past this stage. I'll tell you in history when we sort of get to our analogous stage where we are and heading out to space. Um, okay, so I um, want to read for you a, a little statement here at the bottom. Uh, it's enough for us that the hidden half of the globe is brought to light and the Portuguese daily go further and further beyond the equator. The shores of the unknown soon become accessible for one, an emulation of another sets forth in labors and mighty perils. That's a very eloquent statement, but let's parse it down a little bit here. First of all, go further and further beyond the equator. Now, that was not trivial. If you remember right from our era of the great um, dark ages, if you will, the great interruption, as Daniel Borston calls it, there was a ring of fire and you couldn't go down there and there, the world was flat and all of these things. So, so for a group of people to, to realize that they had accumulated some whispers of knowledge, some indications that all of this for a thousand years, this information being fed to them was wrong. That took a lot of bravery. And in fact, uh, if you look at the diagram here, you'll see three colored, uh, paths, one that's purple, one that's kind of a yellow orange, and one that's green. And you'll see that from 1418 to 1460, which is a long span of time, okay, about 40 years, they crawled, the Portuguese crawled down to this part of Africa, okay. And then literally within a year, they were we're all, there was a break in, there was some break in the exploration here that, well, this is during the lifetime of Prince Henry. When Prince Henry died, the exploration was continued and they pushed on down, but by 19, 1488, sorry, uh, they had, Bartholomew, Bartholomew Diaz had come around the bottom of the Cape of Good Hope and realized that there was a sea path around Africa. It was the first time that Western Europe had confirmation of that, not just sort of a word of mouth story. 10 years later, Vasco da Gama sells out, goes around the Cape of Good Hope, 
sells to India and history is forever changed in 1498. Of course, you all know that in 1492, before Vasco da Gama's um, sailing to Calcut, Calicut in India, uh, Christopher Columbus had sailed for Spain and gone to the Canary Islands or uh, the Bahamas, sorry. Sorry about that. He did go through the Canary Islands and then he went to the Bahamas and so-called discovered America, though he never thought he had discovered America. He thought he was in the East Indies, which is Indonesia. Um, and it took Amerigo Vespucci later to realize that it was a continent, thus the name America. Okay, so this is uh, an interesting thing that, that people had to really break these barriers, and we'll talk about that. And then um, shores unknown becoming accessible, yes, is going out and to places in the planet that you, the Western mind had never heard of before, never knew about. So this was, an, I'm sure, a very exciting time. Um, and then you'll, we'll see what it morphed into in terms of uh, what we call God, glory, and uh, I think it's called um, gold, God, and glory is what, what, what it became, <laughs> okay? A uh, quest for those three. Um, and then this emulation, this is really important because once Portugal started this, uh, what Prince Henry started, you can see, and he started it all the way back in the 1418, 1420s, uh, it took Spain until 1492 to finally go, hey, you know, we, we should hop on this uh, train or this ship, I should say, and, and try to um, figure out how to increase uh, our power and increase uh, direct uh, trade routes for ourselves. Um, it was the fact that these trips here uh, in the 1480s began to bring back gold and ivory and spices and I hate to say it, the beginning of the slave trade of Africa. And that made Portugal very rich very quickly and that's where Spain realized, wait a minute here, we need to get on this ship. See, I got the joke right this time. Okay, so this is a section of Borson's book called Doubling the World. And I, what I thought I would do is just use this slide to give you a nutshell overview of the century of the 1400s because um, a lot goes on in this century. It's really a transformative century. The next most transformative century was the 1900s. Okay, so in the West, meaning Western Europe, okay, um, we will see the science of Ptolemy Revived. Remember, Ptolemy had written that great book, Geography, which he had definitely shown that he could map the world uh, on a sphere. And he had a, um, a map of the world no to, known to him at the time, which was lost for a thousand years and it was finally revived. Okay. Then the Portuguese uh, began the first state-sponsored continuous exploration for which there was no precedent for ever in the history of humanity. Okay, so this is a very uh, interesting transformation in human, the human condition. Spain responds, as I said, via the efforts of Christopher Columbus. Um, in that process, over the next century, a new continent is discovered and, shall I say, exploited. And... Um, because Spain and Portugal were going at this neck and neck with each other, um, they could have easily gone to war. And so this was held in check, believe it or not, by the Pope. Now, if you remember during the Great Interruption, the Dark Ages, it was the Holy Roman Catholic Church which had actually more power over any of the kings of kingdoms or, uh, or so-called emperors like Charlemagne. The Pope really was the glue that uh, he was the referee, will you say, between nation states, which you know were, would really bully each other uh, if not held in check by uh, sort of a meta uh, controlling governing body. So anyway, Spain and Portugal, through the efforts of the Pope, enter what's what we'll call a Cold War, which in a sense was very similar to the Cold War that the United States and the Soviet Union had entered after World War II. What happens in the Middle East, okay? Well, we're gonna find that the Arabs uh, 
kind of they stagnate in terms of exploring the world and the planet. I'm not saying that they that as, as merchants they stagnated or as uh, science goes and, and other cultural aspects of them that didn't stagnate, but that they didn't necessarily grow in these areas. They didn't like experience a renaissance or anything like that. It was just kind of a coasting period for the Middle East. They did not get on ships and join the, you know, the exploration. Okay, so what happens in the East? Okay, so interestingly, little known to most people, in about between 1406 or seven and 1433, which is well before any of this stuff happened in Europe, the Chinese had huge fleets, fleets as large as 30,000 sailors uh, that sailed all throughout the Indian Ocean and the China Sea, all the way down the coast of Africa. And this was an amazing effort. Um, so they really were well ahead of the Europeans. They could have easily rounded Africa. They could have come up to Europe. They could have sailed into the Mediterranean and it would have been a mind blowing situation. Imagine the whole world would be flipped upside down from what we know today if that had happened, okay? The, the, the influence of the Chinese would have been tremendous for the next 500 years. But what happened was their government imploded at, around 1433, and that government became anti-mariner and mariner. And so they shut down all of their sea uh, explorations. And literally what happened for the next half a millennium is that China became the discovered and the exploited, and they lived they they lived in poverty and turmoil with warlords and small kingdoms and civil wars and poverty and um, exploitation by other countries like England and France and the Western nations over the next five hundred years, and really. The, they're only coming out of it in the last 50 years, or I would say, yeah, since the latter part of the 1900s, they're really coming out of this horrible 500 year period. So that is the 1400s in a, a nutshell. I'm gonna have another 1400s in a nutshell a little bit later, but that's in terms of exploration and discovering the unknown, that's the 1400s in a nutshell. We, we will in another lecture talk about the Chinese and the Arabs uh, separately. But let's talk about the motives of going out into the, into the sea, okay? So as we know, the land paths were blocked by the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East after the Mongolian Empire fell, okay? So this was an incentive for Europe to which had become accustomed to this steady flow of goods and um, you know we're talking everything from carpets and household goods silks and clothing all the way to spices and peppers and foods it was a complete shock to the system and the economies and there were a lot of people who developed these things you know now you sort of have a little bit of a feel for it now because you know COVID came along and disrupted the flow of all these economies, including our economy. And, and that's kind of the same thing. I mean, this is a complete disruption and people are out of work. You know, they're, the governments have to go in and, and have relief uh, for the people to make people survive. So the whole, the whole network changed. Uh, you know, for Italy and these other people that, that were big trading uh, countries and city states. So the only way um, to do this was to leave the land. You know, you, you basically, the Europeans were very, very astute at sort of sailing to the Canary Islands and along the very upper part of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean and definitely throughout the Mediterranean uh, along Northern Africa and around Greece and Italy and whatnot. But they'd never set sail to the open sea. It never had really 
come across anybody's mind that was considered to be a vastness that led nowhere. And not to mention that the earth was flat, that people just, it just wasn't in the human mind, okay? For a thousand years there, okay? So the thing about that was uh, that there's in this blue writing here is that sailors, captains, they all had familiarity with the areas that they'd gone. A lot of people had gone there before, uh, they had uh, Portolino maps, they knew the winds, they knew the, the reefs, they knew absolutely all this information. This is going out into the unknown now, okay? So that, that's a little bit frightening, okay? There, there's there absolutely nothing had gone before, okay? And so when the Portuguese soldier, soldiers, <laughs> sailors, went southward down the coast of Africa, they were heading into the unknown, and not to mention they were heading down into the equator, and there was still a lot of fear about what was going to happen to them. They, most of them felt they would never return home as they set out on these explorations. The further they went, the further that feeling of uncertainty went and greater the fear was, okay? So there was no accumulated experiences no handy guides, and they basically were charting this as they go. Okay. Now, I would like to say that even today, when astronauts, let's say, went to the moon, the first destination off of the Earth, that was all charted. Okay. Excuse me. There had been machines, robots, if you will, very rudimentary probes that had actually done the launch left Earth orbit, flew to the moon, navigated that cis-lunar space, knew how to get into orbit around the moon, knew how to land on the moon. All that was done by robots before humans ever did it. And the same thing with Mars today. We've sent probes all the way out of the solar system. So we haven't probed all of the solar system, but the point is we know the mathematics. We know how to sail that ocean through robots. In these days, the people went out there, they did not have any idea what they were getting into. And as it turns, human health was quite an issue. Uh, we are very risk averse today. You know, We are not gonna send a spacecraft with people up on it if we think they have a one in five chance of coming back alive, okay? These sailors had way worse odds than that. And in fact, Sometimes out of a crew of 170, you know, you were lucky if 70 of them came back. When Magellan's crew of 250 people set out sail in 1520s for to circumnavigate the globe, 18 returned. Okay, so we would never do that today. At least I don't think we would. So there's two things that are very different there. All right, let's talk about Ptolemy's map, what it said where it was wrong, and in a sense, um, why it was rediscovered. Okay, so it seems to have really appeared wholesale in around the 1460s, the late 1460s. And um, this probably has a lot to do, to lot to do with the fall of the Byzantine Empire in I think 1453 or something like that. And, you know, all the scholars grabbed all that knowledge from the Greeks and they grabbed it from all the Romans and stuff like that. And they just, they headed west to get away from the Ottomans. And they brought all that information back. Amongst that was Ptolemy's map of the world. And so that got discovered again. Geography made it back into the sciences. Okay. So that's what it's saying. When the, when the land curtain thudded down across Europe, what I'm talking about is the Mongolian Empire receded, the Ottoman Empire came in and filled that space in the Middle East, and bam, Iron Curtain. Okay, so um, here we find on this map, if we will look at this, is, you know, here's your Mediterranean, here's the Iberian Peninsula of Spain, you know, you've got England, you've got uh, Italy, Greece, Turkey, there's Arabia, and this is Africa. And what you'll notice here about Africa is it seems to be landlocked. You know, this, this area here comes out and then it goes up, comes up this side onto Asia. And so basically Ptolemy had, 
shown what, what we know to be an ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, to be a sea that was enclosed. And there was no sea passage around Africa. And then in fact, this sea, the Indian and Chinese sea, um, was also locked in. It wasn't what we would call an ocean. And so the human mind, guess what? Didn't have the concept of an ocean. It didn't have the concept that you could go around the globe, okay? It had the concept that you had a ship and it sailed from inner shore to inner shore in a sea, kind of like the Mediterranean, the land among the sea amongst the land or in the middle of the land. This is, this is really important because it wasn't until you could have this breakthrough in the human mind that you can have a breakthrough in the idea of going someplace. And that again is a central key to the human story of exploration. Not only having breakthrough technologies, but having breakthrough ideas, breakthrough uh, transformation and understanding. So no passage southward and eastward around Africa, southward and then eastward, no passage. Obviously no American continent, okay? The Asian continent is extended way too far, okay? It's extended about 180 degrees rather than the 130 degrees that it should be and a short direct westward passage to Asia. So according to Ptolemy's map, which was studied extensively by Christopher Columbus, guess what? <laughs> it's just a short jaunt to get over here to the east. Okay, so that made a lot of sense to him. Okay, so what we're gonna see that the meaning of ocean really would have to change. And so we're gonna talk first roughly about that change that's going to happen. And then once that um, happened, um, right here, I have it in yellow, that once the concept of the ocean was opened in people's minds, then the, the idea of moving around the earth became open in human minds. Now, in um, 1459, which is about the same time as I was telling you that, um, that uh, Ptolemy's map was making the rounds, a competitive planisphere, if you will, which was supposed to be a map of the entire planet in one shot, um, was put together by Frau Morrow. And you will see that Frau Morrow apparently has gleaned a lot of information beyond Ptolemy, probably from people like Ibn Batatu who had walked all over this African area and walked all over the Middle Eastern area and into Western China. And he, and, and he probably heard stories from people, for example, somebody like Batatu had heard stories from other people about, oh yeah, you know, there, if you go down to the bottom of the continent, there's ocean all around this, this land. This is, a, this is just a big, Africa is just a huge peninsula. Um, and so word of mouth like that would get back and then he would come into Spain and he would talk to the people in Spain and the word would get into Europe. And, and this idea of a word of mouth um, kind of things. There's also another traveler, uh, Niccolo de Conti, who also uh, had walked a lot of the African continent and come back to Europe. And then obviously he didn't necessarily make it to the southern tip of Africa. Uh, but the idea is that he talked to people who had been there and commingled with them, and he brought this information back. At any rate, Frau Morrow, who was a, a, a very famous monk, uh, made this planisphere. And here is the main point. As you can see, again, here's Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Mediterranean, Africa. Now you can see that there is ocean surrounding this huge peninsula of Africa, okay? And you can see there that there's this, this concept that you can actually sail a ship all the way around the world. And this is the first time that this idea had actually been put down uh, and codified and then distributed. Uh, we're still at a time when we're just about to discover the printing press. Well, the printing press was made in the 1450s and it, that's the point in time when 
things like this were duplicated rapidly and disseminated rapidly. And this also accelerated the human consciousness uh, collectively. Okay, all right. Uh, so anyway, he now shows that uh, the ocean is no longer a forbidden road to nowhere. I should have said be because they weren't considered oceans, they were considered embedded seas, Mediterraneans. Okay, but now as a highway, this is basically an open highway. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, I guess he paid some respects to Ptolemy, explains that he follows the master schemes of latitude and longitude um, and whatnot. And I think that that was very important because that meant that we were keeping the culture of Ptolemy's map, the longitude, longitude and latitude that was put together by Hipparchus all the way back in the Hellenist, Hellenistic period of the Greeks and carried through and we still have it today. Okay, so now let's talk about the Portuguese. Why was it the Portuguese? Okay, and it may seem a little bit obvious when you look at the map, geographically speaking, uh, when you look at Europe, okay, and you look at this area in the Mediterranean, most of these countries, all of these countries that had ports, seaports, were all facing into the Mediterranean and their trade routes all really went back and forth here between the east uh, coast of the Mediterranean, the Middle East, to trade with uh, goods that came from the east. There really was no trading routes that were going out, uh, out in this direction, okay? And so there might have been some seafaring, well, there was a lot of seafaring going on in here. In fact, there were some very powerful trading companies that existed up in Norway and, and Denmark, um, but which we really don't talk about in this class, but they really were pretty active up there. But the situation is you got Portugal, it was sort of, you know, at the end of this trail of trade routes. So by the time things get there, I'm sure they're highly marked up. Portugal sort of gets the leftovers and the dregs. Um, but geographically, you know, they're facing the ocean. I mean, they have a lot of rivers, a lot of port towns, and these rivers all flow out to the ocean. And when they go to their beaches and their mindset is not just, oh, I'm looking across a sea at another you know, land, I'm looking out into a vast nothingness. And so that mindset was there. We're gonna find out there's some other things um, that happened, but the, but the bottom line is these people naturally faced outward and they were in a sense um, on the periphery of this, the classic centers of European civilization. Now, there are some right conditions that happened I'm gonna name a few of them, but um, again, this is sort of an overview of the 1400s, uh, right conditions. And the thing here is that um, all these conditions can exist, but you are gonna need one more. And that one more we'll talk about is a leader, a human with vision, a single person sometimes with lots of money, and a vision. And that model, sort of the, like what we call the Elon Musk model, the Bill Gates model, or the, the Jeff Bezos model, where you've got the, uh, the Titan uh, that has a lot of money and then is using it to, in the case of Bill Gates for philanthropy, in the case of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they're using their billions of dollars to build rocket ships, okay? And, and also, uh, um, uh, Sir Richard Branson for Virgin Galactic, who's uh, going to probably fly somebody from space in 2020. Um, in fact, Jeff Bezos is predicting that he will fly a human in space in 2020, um, and therefore SpaceX will not be the only one. But I digress. The point is that you, you have to have the right conditions, but then you have to have a, an impetus. And sometimes that impetus is a single person and they can change the world. Okay, so what happened in Europe during this period of time? First of all, there was the Hundred Years' War and the War of the Roses. And this was a, a horrible period of battle and war between the, the countries of Europe, okay? A lot of civil strifes, invasions of countries, okay? A lot of, a lot of persecution of Jews or Muslims or Christians 
depend, you know, if you weren't a, a Catholic, but, um, you know, these kinds of things. Okay. So this was a really disruptive time for the classic centers uh, culture of, of Europe, but Portugal being out there in periphery had, had been able to geographically keep itself isolated. So it was sort of buffered from this from, by Spain. Another big thing that I already mentioned was the Byzantine Empire fell. That happened in 1453 when the Ottomans came in and took over this area. And this whole corridor between Europe and the, and the Balkans, uh, they, all the information just went out to the West to Italy, Germany, France, you know, and, and, and Spain and Portugal. And that really was um, a cultural growth. And so one of the things that happened there was, you, you know, a lot of people would say, I'm not gonna go to Spain because I'm gonna get persecuted in Spain, I'll, you know, but Portugal, I understand that they're letting people move there and it's, you know, um, an open society, and that is the truth. Portugal was very tolerant. They, they, they had no persecution against Muslims or Jews or Christians or anything like that. So um, that's the blue bullet at the bottom. But the reason people went there, a lot of that was because of this shift in the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Spain, okay, they shared the same peninsular advantage so why not Spain? Well, first of all, like we said, geographically, they weren't facing to the ocean. They weren't an ocean-facing people or facing away from a European civilization. They were facing toward it. And the other part is that the, the Ferdinand and Isabella, the, the king and queen at the time, um, they were seriously persecuting Jews and Muslims. They were trying to purge this, you know, Iberian Peninsula, if you will, P P Spain, from Jews and Muslims, okay? And there were a lot of Muslims, if you remember now, uh, from the 700s, the, the, the Muslim uh, kingdoms had moved up and controlled Spain a great deal. And that's, you know, Spain is sort of a, a real crossroads mixture of the Arabic and, and uh, European world. But nonetheless, um, the uh, Ferdinand and uh, Isabella were, staunch Catholics and they wanted the Jews and they wanted the Muslims out. Um, and th they were also involved in these wars and so they were nearly bankrupt. So they, they weren't thinking about how they could put together a large program of exploration, for example. So that leaves Portugal hanging out there, ripe hanging fruit, okay? And then in sharp contrast to saying down here, they were united, okay? And if people came in, they brought in ideas. They were excellent craftsmen. They were, uh, they were intellectuals. They, they brought science. And th these people all worked together. And I, I don't want to paint a utopia, but it was definitely a modern, relative free country in that sense. And it was still a monarchy, okay, but it was untouched by a lot of civil disturbance, um, untouched by it, okay? So enter the last ingredient, the right person at the right time, okay? Which history is replete with stories of people at the right time, at the right place, okay? Prince Henry, okay. The king at this time, this is just around the early 1400s, uh, was King John the first and he had six sons and the third of those was Prince Henry. So he had no chance that he was going to have the crown put on his head. So he tried to make a name for himself as young ambitious uh, princes would do. And he actually uh, went and raided cities in Morocco, which were Muslim cities. And he had seen how much incredible trade was there. It was just wealthy with exotic spices and riches and, you know, cloth and whatnot. But once he took over the town, it became a ghost town. But he knew all that had come from Africa, the continent of Africa. But so that's stuck in his brain. Okay. Well, he, he went to go and uh, conquer some more cities in Africa. And it turned out that King John said, 
uh, son, I didn't give you permission to develop this armada and go conquer these towns in Africa. So turn that ship around and come home right now. Well, poor Prince Henry was highly embarrassed by this, as you can imagine. So he stayed away from the court where the king was and he took refuge down in the southern part of, um, of uh, Portugal in a small uh, cape known as the Sacred Promontory, which is known also as, I think it's pronounced Sagres. Okay, so this is this little peninsula that sticks out the bottom of Portugal and he basically hid down there. Of course, he had access to the money bags and he decided that he was going to start the endeavor of just continuing to explore Africa, if not conquer it. He thought he would go ahead and explore it. Okay, and this gave him something to do. Um, not that he was sitting around bored all the time. Anyway, he started something that never has been stopped. I mean, that basically this idea of systematic, charted, methodical exploration, step by step by step. And he became the first person to put together sort of a logistics center for exploration. And because of that, as we, we mentioned, he is also known as the father of continuous discovery. And we have never stopped being continuous discoverers since the days of Prince Henry. Okay, so this is the uh, Southern Peninsula, Peninsula of Sagres down here. Someday I wish to um, go there. I would love to, to walk around that area and walk on the ground where Prince Henry and, and his uh, team of, of uh, research and development uh, individuals were working. Um, so this is this area here became what we know as the first modern enterprise for exploration. Um, in a sense here, this is interesting. He put all of the ingredients together. It was great at logistics, okay? And this is the first time anybody had done this, okay? It's like the first Walmart where they, you know, they do everything from the, the stocking the shelves to basically growing the food and then transporting it. Okay, so th this is what, this is the beginnings of that. And Henry set up, he, you know, he collected all the books and knowledge as he could, you know, Frau Morrow's Planisphere and Ptolemy's geography book, all the sea charts that he could from anybody who had gone anywhere around Africa, okay. He got sea captains, pilots, mariners. Now, a pilot is somebody who knows the local areas along the sea and they take over the ship when you're in territories, you know, small patches very well and they take over the ship during those, those small patches of sea where uh, things can be dangerous and a pilot, an expert is required. Um, all kinds of sailors and mariners, uh, map makers, instrument and compass builders, okay. Ship builders, obviously metal workers, uh, carpenters, um, and all kinds of craftsmen are required to build cells, you know, develop the rope, carve the wood, build the ships, forge the nails, I mean, everything, okay. So he planned voyages, and when the captains would come back, the captains were informed to take detailed notes on everything, he would compile them into a single library, like sort of a, a, a Britannica encyclopedia of, of all the knowledge that was gained on each trip. He really developed, and that's why I have it read here, a system of incremental knowledge gathering. And this was the first time again. And it's, it's really a special thing that he did, okay? What he started continues today. Now, we have to have our breakthrough technology. We had our breakthrough notion of going out into the sea. Now we have our breakthrough technology to take us there, okay? You know, for example, when it comes to space, people had thought about going out into space a great deal. In fact, Jules Verne had written about it in the 1800s, sending people to the moon, but we didn't have the technology and the technology was the breakthrough technology for that was the rocket, which didn't happen until the 1940s, okay? And though, even though people worked on that technology all the way through the 20s and 30s, it didn't break through until the early 40s. In this case, um, a cell that had a triangular shape 
um, was part of the breakthrough technology. And this actually was borrowed from the shape of sales from the Muslim traders in the monsoon marketplace. Um, word of these sales had come through and, and some of those ships have been sailing in the Eastern Mediterranean. And they picked up that this sail was very good for tacking so that you could actually traverse back and forth up against the wind. And so this was a ship that could follow the wind and then it could come back against the wind. So it guaranteed that you could come home. And that was a tremendous breakthrough. It's also a very small, rugged and powerful ship. Okay. And so this caravel became, you know, literally the, you know, the starship, if you will, of the um, 1400s. Okay. So this is just showing you how small this thing is um, going from the, the very bottom hold to the lower deck to the main deck on top, which is being shown here. And then of course, these two areas, uh, the quarter decks, um, yeah, I guess not everybody was going to make it off. Uh, they didn't really have an emergency uh, uh, lifeboats. Um, you know, the sailors were exposed. They slept in hammocks. It, it was not a pretty sight, but uh, these ships were the highest technology that the Europeans had built up to that point. So we got the triangular cells for going up against the wind. We have a very smooth round hole so that it basically can handle the swells in the oceans very well. And then this rudder was also another breakthrough in the technology that it was very, 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 um, it moved a lot of water and then allowed quick turns to be possible so that they can maneuver. And it held a lot of materials so that they could bring materials back. Okay, so um, Henry um, watched, he pushed his soul, um, sailors as far as he could. And this green line, again, is showing you roughly um, what, what the sailors knew pretty much before uh, they started to go down further down the coast, which is marked by this red. The problem was um, there was this little cape out here. It was called Cape Bahador, um, which is called known as the Cape of Fear. And there was something about this cape that so many of Prince Henry's captains would go down to that spot. And they had all kinds of make-believe reasons left over from the great interruption ideas that were swimming in their head that you could not survive going past this cape. Sea monsters, tides that would carry you off the edge of the earth, uh, what, all kinds of stuff, okay? And so he pushed and he pushed and he pushed and he pushed. So from 1433 to 1460, it was slow going, okay? By 1441, okay, with all that money and all that time and that energy and sending out all those men and those ships and, you know, they had only gone about 250 miles beyond this cape, okay? But even so, by 1444, they had brought the first African slaves back to Portugal. And there were a lot of people in the court, in the power uh, structure of the government who really thought that Prince Henry was just wasting crown money. But when he started bringing back a little gold, a little ivory and some slaves, they changed their tune. And all of a sudden now Prince Henry was doing something very great for the country, okay? Now, Prince Henry died in 1460, okay? He didn't really get to see the complete fruition of his dream. But what, again, what he started was continued, okay? So he is properly celebrated as the founder of continuous discovery, okay? Um, this is as far as they got by the time Prince Henry had passed away, okay? Now there was a lot of succession of the crown. Uh, I'm not asking you to memorize these people and the dates and all those things. You know, I'm not into that kind of stuff. It, this is a story about what happened, but this is the succession of the people who had power in Portugal and what happened to them um, and who was um, in the cold war with Spain and, and things like that. So Prince Henry, the third son under King John the first. And you would think that then um, 
it would be um, King John's first son that would have taken the crown, but then it turns out there was a power shuffle and, you know, people got killed and, you know, people bully each other. And it was uh, then Prince Henry's nephew uh, that became the next king, King Alfonso V. Okay. And he ruled from 1469 to 1481. Following him was King John from 81 to 95. And you'll notice that King John then was king of Portugal in 1492 when Columbus sailed. Okay, so he was king when Columbus sailed for, for Spain. Okay, he was king of Portugal. Following King John, shortly after Columbus had done his first or two sailing trips, uh, the King Manuel I came into power and he was called the fortunate one because under him, that's when Portugal really got going with its exploration um, and was in the Cold War competing against Spain and all of that. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Under Alfonso V, exploration became profitable for the first time. They brought home the slaves. They brought home the ivory, the gold. Maybe you've heard of the ivory coast and the gold coast and the slave coast of Africa. Well, it all comes from this Portuguese uh, explorations. Okay, so he, he began to get some profit from this. Under King John, uh, the path to India was discovered. So it really wasn't until um, 1488, 89, that Diaz had found that you could get around to Africa. And then 10 years later, it was in 1498 that, in fact, uh, they made it all the way to India. But it was during King John's time that the, the pathway uh, hadn't been sailed, but was discovered that you could get all the way to the East Indies by sailing around Africa, okay? Also during this time, again, Christopher Columbus sailed, and that set up the tension between Spain because Columbus sailed for Spain and Portugal, okay? And then under Manuel, they sailed all the way to India. They exploited the whole area. They, they took down all the ports. In, in all of the monsoon marketplace, they took complete control. They pirated that whole area and just brought home riches like crazy. So uh, he's considered the fortunate because it was at this time that the, the you know, they had these, this era called imperialism and colonialism and stuff like that. I call this the era of takeism. I mean, there, I don't know what these people were thinking that, you know, it was left over from millennia or I should say hundreds of tens of thousands of years of people just taking what was in the next village for themselves. And it got uh, carried over into global levels uh, by the Portuguese and by Spain. The era of takeism. Okay, so let's talk about um, this breakthrough here for uh, Vasco da Gama and Bartholomew Diaz. Uh, 1488, so four years before Christopher Columbus sails, um, under King John II, uh, in 1488, uh, Bartholomew Diaz takes his ships and sets sail on this idea that he can hopefully, for the first time, make it around Africa and make it to India. That was his goals, okay? Um, what happened was he got caught in a storm, so he went very further south. This, this red line is his path on the way out. And he went all the way down here because of that storm. And then when he came back up north, he realized that he had round the, uh, the, the Cape. And so he sailed a little bit further to the east. But then um, here's an example of where he, where he actually stopped in this port here. And um, they, they anchored and he wanted to load up the ships and keep going, but his crew and the captains of the other ships forced him to turn back. And so he actually had to have them fill out some documents and sign it saying, we are forcing you to go back because, you know, he didn't want to go back and say that he had been derelict in his duties. Um, you know, there's a quote from him in Borston talking about how his heart was shattered, that his chance at glory and history to be the first to sail to the Indias had been robbed from him. Um, you know, it could have happened differently. He could have, you know, hung all of them from a yard arm and, and continued to sail, but he turned back 
And uh, we're, we're going to find out that Christopher Columbus and Bartholomew Dias uh, cross paths in an interesting way, um, which changed the course of history. Okay, so this, this is a story in 1488, four years before Columbus, of turning around after realizing, yes, you can make a breakthrough. So this was the first direct confirmation into Prince Henry's encyclopedia of what's going on for how Africa is, okay? Um, this is the story of the uh, crossing the paths of Columbus and Dias. And it turns out that by this time, by the time Dias had sailed and come back, Columbus had been shopping his idea to sail west to all the kings in Portugal, King John II and Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain. And I can't remember who the king was of France and the king of England at the time, but he, he was selling this, this idea and nobody was buying. And he had already gone to talk to King John about it um, before Bartholomew Dias had set sail and King John was set up a committee and they were thinking about it. And, you know, Christopher Columbus got bored and left and went to Spain. And then he left Spain and he was coming back to um, Portugal to talk to King John again. And uh, when he did, when he came into Lisbon this time in 1488, Dias's ships sailed into the port. And there it was, uh, Dias got off in great glory saying, I have found the passage to India and the East Indias around Africa. And Columbus obviously knew instantaneously that King John was not gonna be interested in sailing west and doing that, funding that exploration. And so that was why Christopher Columbus then went back to Spain and now was able to tell the Spanish court what had happened in Portugal uh, if they hadn't heard it already from all of their spies, because trust me, they were spies everywhere. Um, and uh, this was one of the reasons why Spain decided to go forth and fund Christopher Columbus. Okay, now, you would think that after Diaz sailed all the way around Africa, or not all the way around, to this, past the southern tip of Africa, that Portugal would be like, oh my gosh, load up the ships, let's do another excursion and get it rolling, okay? But it turned out there was sort of another squirmish about power and there was this disruption of succession of the crown, okay, you know? And this running dispute um, kind of kept Portugal out of the ability to, to concentrate on going and fulfilling the dream of going to the East. Then what happened was because of that delay in 1492, Christopher Columbus sails west for, for Spain, okay? So that discovery, when Christopher Columbus came back to Spain and the word reached King, uh, I guess it's gonna be um, Manuel I at, at some point here, the, um, Oh, I'm sorry, when it, it was still King John in power at the time, sorry. Um, when, when it reached King John, King John said, well, wait a minute, look, that's our, that's our stuff. I mean, we're, we're heading out there. We're, we're going around Africa and we're gonna, we're gonna, we own those trade routes, damn it. And so they argued against Spain and said, that's stuff that Columbus put the Spanish flag on out there in the West, that's our stuff. Okay, and so they really uh, had this running dispute and it, because King John had argued that these are really gotta be Portuguese lands, not Spanish lands, uh, they really got close to the brink of war. And so they went to the Pope and said, Pope, you know, help us decide this before we start to blow each other's countries off the map. And uh, the Pope said, look, you know what I'm gonna do? I am going to draw a line down the planet um, that is so many miles or at such a longitude out to, to the east and um, sorry it's to the west and that line on one side that's Portugal land and on the other side that's Spain land so the Pope took the planet split it in two and gave half to the Portuguese and half to the Spanish okay of course, that's, you gotta find out where it meets on the other side. We'll get to that in a minute, okay? 
This was happened in 1494, um, two years after Columbus had sailed. Okay, this was a very important treaty. Um, it stopped them from going at war. It allowed them to continue their explorations and not fire on each other's ships each time they ran into each other. Okay, and basically develop into this uh, actual hot war. Okay. So this is called uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas, it happened in the summer of 1494. And um, this uh, line was 1,200 nautical miles to the west, or what they call 370 leagues, okay? And again, anything to the west, as you can see in this diagram, here's, here's the line for the Treaty of Tordesillas. It goes right through modern day Brazil. This is why Brazilians speak Portuguese today, and over here they speak Spanish today. And um, these lands were all Spain. So this is a pretty good deal for the new continent in terms of things uh, for Spain. But again, the area over here, which is gonna figure prominently shortly in the next decade, um, all belong to Portugal. Okay. Now I'm gonna move ahead a little bit because I want you to know that the completion of that line on the other side. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a sidestep uh, and a leapfrog in history up to the 1520s. In the 1520s, then it was when um, uh, Ferdinand Magellan had sailed around the world for Spain. And of course, by now, uh, Portuguese had taken over all these areas along Africa, that's the blue here, and all of these ports in this monsoon marketplace, if you will, the Indian Ocean, Chinese, South Chinese Sea. And so when, when Magellan's ships came through here, there you know, was obviously a, a clash and whatnot. So the deal was that the, they had to come back to the Pope and say, hey, you need to draw another line. And they argued and they argued. And they came up in 1529 with the Treaty of Zaragoza. And that was basically another line that cut the world such that it divided the lands of Spain and the lands of Portugal or the influence. So Portugal got all of this area and Spain got all of the Americas and this area here, okay? And so <laughs> Spain really kind of got screwed a little bit because they got way less uh, longitudinal uh, expanse than, um, than Portugal did. And then the other thing is that, you know, Portugal really did get the Spice Islands, which at that time were producing lucrative amounts of trade and wealth, at, whereas the Americas really had not paid off yet. So uh, Portugal really went out on that one. So that, that's the Treaty of Zaragoza. It's the bookend in 1529 to the 1494 Treaty of Tordesillas. Okay, so. But Bartholomew Diaz sails to the bottom of Africa in 1488, goes home, Columbus sees him, goes to Spain, gets the money from Spain, sails out in 1492 to the west, discovers some lands out there, comes back. King John says, uh, 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 that's our land. 1494, Treaty of Tordesillas, okay? Now, it took until 1497, okay, before Portugal got back on the wheels and now with King Manuel I uh, at the helm and they were able to then sail uh, and follow Bartholomew Diaz's path. So Vasco da Gama put together some ships, about 170 men, okay, of which 100 died before he returned. And they set sail and they came down, they came through the bottom of Africa sailed up the eastern coast of Africa, and then took this jaunt and headed over here uh, to Calicut. And that was the first contact that Western peoples had made with the Eastern peoples by going by ship, okay? And he landed there in May of 1498, okay? Um, Borston really talks about what an amazing seafaring feat this was. It, it, far exceeded the skills and necessary demands that Columbus made uh, by sailing out to the West. Um, but any, at any rate, in, in May of 1498, he landed in Calicut. And the thing about Vasco da Gama is, you know, 
he became very wealthy. He became a hero and he really got to live the fame of his explorations. Uh, Christopher Columbus uh, never brought back big pots of gold. And so uh, he really didn't gather that fame or get to enjoy those, um, you know, the booty of his efforts. Okay, now uh, you can imagine what it must have been like, maybe, if you're uh, in India and there are a lot, uh, there's a lot of culture there, there's a lot of society there, there's a lot of trade there, a lot of merchants, okay? And so when he got there, this was a mature area, okay? And a thriving area, mostly Muslim. And these merchants, of course, were very interested in trading with these newcomers and exploring them and uh, trying to understand them, okay? Um, but it turned out that Vasco da Gama was not somebody to be toyed with, okay? And the first thing he did was just completely obliterate these people, crimes against humanity, okay? They had no idea what was coming, okay, when these ships sailed into the bay, okay? Um, it turns out that by the time Vasco da Gama sailed back to Portugal, he had brought home riches worth 60 times the original cost of the expedition. So that was obviously clearly going to be something that they continued to do and exploit and continue to get money. The profits were off the charts, okay? Takeism, if you will. This is just the beginning, okay? Here's an example of two stories that we have. And when he returned in February 1502, he set out this skin, but this time with a military fleet, okay? And his idea was then to turn Calicut into a Portuguese port, okay? So here is the log of one of his officers. We took a Mecca ship on board of which were 380 men and many women and children. This was a ship that was on its way to Mecca for the pilgrimage of Mecca. We took from it 12,000 gold ducats. And I've got a picture of a ducat here so you can understand that we're talking about basically coins. Goods worth at least another 10,000. And we burned the ship and all the people on board with gunpowder on the first day of October. And that's what they did. They just became pirates of the high sea. They took what they found, they killed the people. It didn't matter. On October, at the end of that same month, okay, then he now anchored outside Calicut and he ordered the local ruler, it's called the Samari, to surrender the city, okay? And he demanded the expulsion, demanded that all Muslims leave the city. I mean, this is not trivial stuff. This is complete and total takeover and disruption. So to make his point, quote, he seized several traders and fishermen who he picked up casually on the harbor. He hanged them at once. Then he cut up their bodies and tossed their hands, feet, and heads into a boat, which he sent ashore with a message in Arabic, suggesting that the Samari use these to make a curry. What was he saying? I mean business, okay? When he departed with Lisbon with his cargo of treasure, he left behind five military ships, it was the first permanent naval force that Europe had left in, in a foreign seas or a foreign country uh, in history. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the beginning of the world in which you live in today. This is where it happened. The balance of power and terror changed dramatically in only a few decades, okay? As you can see, Vasco da Gama and the Portuguese picked off the ports one by one, treating them the same way that they treated the people of Calicut, okay? So we have Joa, Colombo, Malacca, and Malaysia, the true Spice Islands. If you control this area here, you control all the trade for the monsoon marketplace that came through here, okay? Plus this area here, and then all along the, the trade routes that were touched by the Arabic countries up here in the Middle East. And so they basically now own this entire area and were pirates and disrupted the area. So all the way through to about 1530s, they, it, they conquered the area. 
They now ruled the Indian Ocean, the Arabic Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Bay of Bengal, the Gulf of Thailand, and the Asian Ocean. Okay, bam. After 700 years to 1,000 years of peaceful trade happening here, it was all completely eradicated and now is controlled by literally pirates. Okay, not to mention that they set up slaves in these towns and use slave labor to continue to, to pursue the building of their wealth. Okay, the consequences reached around the world. Okay, so where you have this horrific thing happening in a place that for 700 years had a peaceful marketplace, okay, we now have riches pouring into Europe. Okay, so we talked about how much the Italian splendor in Pisa and Genoa and, and Florence had come through their trade routes in the Mediterranean. It now was not doing that anymore. It came around Africa, it was all coming through Portugal. So the traffic of the Asiatic treasures, as you will, spices, drugs, gems, silks, they all came now, not through the Persian Gulf, through um, uh, Egypt and Alexandria and whatnot through the Mediterranean, but they came around Africa and the Cape of Good Hope by Portugal. Um, the Portuguese were quickly powerful, quickly rich. By 1503, the price in pepper had dropped to 20% of it was uh, in Venice. And so they just basically were making hand over fist on all this money. Um, they wiped out that Italian trade circuit entirely and monopolize now the trade for Europe. Okay, um, the trading posts and the ports of commerce uh, and civilization along these coasts within the closed Mediterranean uh, to the shores of the open Atlantic and the boundless world reaching all of the oceans of Asia. So they literally started an age in which they had all of that African coast. And I, if you'll let me go back to my map here of the Treaty of Saragossa. Um, yes, they, they, they owned all of this area here and controlled all of this area here, as you can see. And um, eventually had set sail and controlled this area along Brazil, which became an area where a lot of sugar cane um, was, uh, Built, developed and a lot of African slaves uh, made their way to Brazil. Okay. Now I want you to note that they never they never took over the lands entirely. They just took over the ports and the areas that they wanted to control, and they raided and pirated the open seas. So they never colonized their lands. We're going to find out that Spain actually colonized. Uh, they took over, set up governments themselves, and controlled the lands. The, the Portuguese did just grab the port towns and then protected those and were interested in the sea routes. Okay, it turns out that that is our last slide for today. And um, I forgot to give the old space capsule uh, payload contains Dias's weather beaten caravels and I'm not supposed to say this at the end all the time, but I keep forgetting to say it because I get so into what I'm lecturing. Okay, um, when we come back next time, we're gonna talk about Christopher Columbus in more detail, and we're gonna put the Spanish side of the equation into this before we move on into the all hell breaks loose and the Europeans take over the world. Okay, so um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture and uh, we'll see you next time for the next installment.